So just let me just take a few minutes to introduce uh, our speaker today. Um, I'm much honored to actually introduce her, uh, Dr. Karen Longman, professor in the Department of Higher Education, which um, is, I think most of you know this, but maybe some of you don't know, it's in the School of Behavioral and Applied Sciences, not in the School of Ed. Um, and she directs APU's uh, PhD uh, in higher education program. <clears throat> she came to APU in 2006, um, having earned PhD and MA from the University of Michigan, um, an MA before that from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and a BA from Albion College. Uh, I, I hope I pronounced that right. She okay. is a, she is a prolific scholar and uh, leader in education studies. Um, she was a vice president for professional development and research with the CCCU in Washington, D.C. for almost 20 years and vice president for academic affairs and dean of the faculty at Greenville College for six years leading up to her coming to APU. Um, she is a leading expert in I say a leading expert, and I put in actually parentheses in my notes, or the leading expert in faith-based higher education, gender issues, and leadership development, having published at least um, 30 or 30 books or articles in, in those areas. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out that in 2016, uh, the CCCU presented Dr. Longman with the prestigious Dellenbach Global Leadership Award. And that's an honor she now shares with luminaries such as Oz Guinness and Alistair McGrath. So when you think of Oz Guinness and Alistair McGrath, you now think of Karen Longman as well. Mm. And today she will be presenting on exploring the, the motivators, um, encouragers and barriers to leader identity development, Karen. Mm, thanks very much. Don has been a great colleague, friend, and supporter, so I appreciate that. And I mentioned to you, Don, uh, I'm 150% happy to have a small group today. I already presented my sabbatical talk when I came back to all of our students and all of our faculty over here in the doctoral programs in higher ed. Uh, and it actually has been a year, as you can see on the screen in my fall 2019 sabbatical, so I beat COVID. The person who had a similar sabbatical after me in spring 2020 had to cut it short um, because of COVID, so I feel like I snuck in under the wire. So I'm going to try to cover three things today, and because we're small and friendly, I was thinking of this kind of like if I had a scrapbook on my dining room table or my living room table in my house, and I had been on a very fun uh, major trip for me and people walk in and it would be nice if people were interested in what I had done. So our students were interested and our faculty were interested, but it's nice that several of you who are from the broader APU community would check in. So I came back with this singular comment to our faculty. It was the best possible sabbatical. And I say that because for me, it involved three dimensions, which I think all should be part of a sabbatical. One was renewal and self-care, one was having some fun, and one was scholarly productivity. Uh, and I would say me being a big J on Myers-Briggs and also liking closure on things, uh, just making progress on my research agenda every year uh, the PhD students are divided into research teams and they typically over a two-year period begin some kind of research project and then they shift their energies into their dissertation and leave me with bits and pieces of an article and research that we've done but it needs to be polished because they've written different parts of it and it obviously with varying quality so I was able to finish actually three articles that have been hanging over my head and that feels great so uh, since we're small let's see it's not letting me advance there we go um, since we're small feel free to pop in or or you know just interrupt if you have any questions i'm going to move through that those three sections fairly quickly and then we'll see if people have comments or interaction i th 
thought I would just take a minute to go back to Leviticus because I was convicted by these thoughts out of Leviticus about how important it is uh, to take time for rest. And obviously scriptures, both Old and New Testament, spend a lot of time on the Sabbath, which I tend to ignore. And um, so even thinking about my sabbatical, I, I was convicted again, but just to share these words from Leviticus, uh, the Lord to Moses on Mount Sinai, the land itself must, that's interesting, must observe a Sabbath to the Lord for six years, sow your fields, for six years prune your vineyards, gather their crops, but in the seventh year the land is to have a, a year of Sabbath rest, a sabbatical unto the Lord, and then it goes on to say, do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines, the land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you. So when I look at the first two in terms of rest and renewal and having fun, I, I think they fulfilled what Leviticus is asking of us of a sabbatical or a Sabbath rest. Uh, APU being um, pragmatic puts the emphasis on the third part of the equation. Uh, and says the purpose of the sabbatical program is to strengthen the institution's academic program. So providing faculty with the opportunity to enhance their teaching effectiveness, pursue professional development and conduct scholarly research and writing. So that's the third dimension, which I called three gifts that this sabbatical gave me. Um, some of you are familiar with this, but uh, there's a foundation in the Grand Rapids area that's been very generous and funded scholars, either as families or as individuals, to go use this uh, house uh, on the left side there, which is a writer's retreat house, uh, just maybe 10 minutes from Hope College on the north side of Holland, Michigan. The little paved road on the right is a U that goes dead ahead into Lake Michigan. Uh, just, you know, steps from the house. And the bottom picture was my command station for the semester of my sabbatical with a huge dining room table uh, where I could spread out all of my articles. And then I had another cabinet with other articles arranged with those post-it notes where I could always find what I needed. So it was a gift to have space and to not need to pack things up and to be able to spread out and find what I needed. So. Uh, this is funded by what's called the Issachar Fund, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, very generous toward me and toward APU for the time away. So gift number one uh, was, I think of the Folgers commercial, the best part of waking up. I, I did not fully realize what a difference it made to be three hours later out in Michigan. So I could get up at seven or 6.30 or 7.30 and it's 4.30 in the morning in California. And I really felt like I had two or three hours when absolutely nobody would expect anything of me. So the quiet time Bible in the middle there takes you through the Bible in two years with uh, reflection questions and application questions. I love this little book called The Spirituality of Gratitude. Um, and just the time difference and the time to be quiet in the morning and read, uh, both from the Bible and pray and journal, was a huge gift, which I think most of us in the academic world don't have on a regular basis. At least I get away from that and did not have it. Um, so under my self-care label, I would also say I'd, I got into Audible for the first time. I think Vicki had actually given me several books that she had liked. and. Um, I read several books. I would say the ones that influenced me most are the bottom corners. Uh, Hillbilly Elegy there, which is very powerful about the underclass and Appalachian culture. And then I started using this book, Ebony and Ivy, that looks at the history of higher education in the United States in terms of the Native American population and then the impact of slavery. Also, uh, Educated was a really powerful book for me. And then Chris Collins here had recommended The Vocation of the Christian Scholar, um, which I was just looking at from different faith traditions and faith integration. So it was a gift to have time to read, which I wish I did more of. Uh, very quickly, maybe I'll uh, just stop after these first two gifts because then I get into some scholarship and I don't have some time for interaction or questions if you want, but I took most of a week and went up to Ottawa where I'd never been for the International Leadership Association Conference. Um, ILA is 
doing a nice job of featuring seven books in this series on women in leadership. That was just the table at the bottom there. Uh, this was their 21st annual international conference and always a great opportunity both for scholarly interaction and um, a lot of fun contacts. I was part maybe 10 years ago of creating a women in leadership affinity group within the organization that has about 1200 members now. Uh, from all over the world, women and men. Um, it's it's my professional conference. So unfortunately, going remote this fall from San Francisco, but it's it's the go-to conference for me. And then on the right, uh, the Women in Leadership Affinity Group also hosted a conference of the summer of my sabbatical, uh, where I was featured in an article that they published about different people making a difference through their leadership, and mine was subtitled "Leadership Grounded in Faith." So that was quite an honor. Um, and then also I spent a week in Washington DC. Part of my sabbatical plan for APU was to look back at the track record of the leadership development institutes that I've been involved with for almost uh, 20 years now um, and work on their databases and do some other projects for them for a week. So my friend long term Shirley Hoekstra there is the president. Uh, and we also got a chance to visit the um, African American history uh, museum culture. Uh, which had opened just within the year prior and the CCCU had arranged to take all the presidents into that museum for half a day of their annual meeting. Uh, so I got to go in on the front end with the person planning the conference and spent most of an afternoon poking around. It's very, very powerful. So that was a treat. And then thirdly, I spent a week, uh, which was also part of my plan out at Eastern University near Philly. Uh, that's a long term colleague partly through ILA, Yuan Shang, you can see in the books on the right, the research methodology that I'm going to talk about in a minute is called collaborative autoethnography, where a group there you have uh, complete or, or partial autoethnography. And to do it collaboratively, a group of people goes through the same experience in their journal and journaling and self reflective. Uh, and she has written one of the main books on on autoethnography as a qualitative method, but then also has gotten into this niche market of collaborative autoethnography and also looking at spirituality in higher ed. So the sponsorship article I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, we were working hard on that article while I was with her and a colleague at Eastern who's become a good friend. So that was my fun part. Um, maybe I'll just stop for a second and say anybody, I think we're small. I can only see the one person. Uh, I, I should be able to look at you all, but anybody got a, a thought or feedback or question about those two pieces? Because I'm going to leave those now. Are you all out there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the the uh, the room that you had on the Issachar. Yeah. Um, um, were you living in that house alone? Yes, uh -huh. they, the way they arrange it is that they uh, fund a scholar to use the house, but the scholars allowed to bring family, but not pets. So some people who have been awarded, you can either you could get an eight week block and I asked for two eight week blocks. Um, uh, the problem I'm kind of the ideal person. I was the ideal person because I didn't have kids that needed to uproot and get into a different school system or a spousal job obligations and that kind of thing. I had the latitude to be out there. So yeah, you get the whole house. Was it, was it in a neighborhood? I didn't quite see on the sides or where yeah, it, it's a rural setting. Yeah, I the houses are along that U drive that goes down to Lake Michigan and there's almost zero traffic because well, the only people that come in there own the houses, some of which are summer, but they're quite nice houses. So it wasn't a large or a fancy house. There's a family that owns it and the Issachar Fund lets the house be used by scholars during the fall and spring and then the family uses it during the summer. Okay. Yeah, so it was perfect for me and especially having the space to spread out and not need to pack up. Yeah, and they actually give you a an honorarium, I believe, $35 a day towards your meals and expenses for living there, as well as giving some money to APU to support the scholars that are in the house to free and, me and up. Then, and then your time after that, after you went over to DC, um, mm -hmm. just curious, uh, you obviously went to the CCCU area. Mm -hmm. um, 
were, were old colleagues still around from there, or, uh, or have they all passed on, moved, <laughs> passed away, but moved on careful. to other areas like yourself, or, or how, how was that? Just yeah, uh, thank you for asking, Don. Uh, the staff feels very young to me. They actually did a briefing on the Fairness for All um, legislation that was coming through the Congress, and surely, as a background as a lawyer and is very savvy on federal issues now and very good connections on Capitol Hill. So they had a two hour staff meeting just to brief the next generation about what's going on with some of these federal issues, which was really interesting for me. Um, not many people that I worked with were still there, but they're still in the DC area. So I was able to see some people that have been colleagues over the years and that was a huge gift. So, okay, yeah, it was a very fun week. Yeah, and it was beautiful because the leaves were changing. So when, when I move into the third part, which is what APU cares about and legitimately so, I just want you to know that it was re renewing and it was restful and it was self-care time, which I think a sabbatical should be, uh, but also some fun trips. Um, but the scholarly productivity, and I wanna just spend a few minutes on this and then we'll see if you have other thoughts or questions. I was able to finish these three articles. If I think about, and I think most of you know this, um, the thing that I have been burdened about for a long time is when I edited the book called Diversity Matters and when I edited the book called Thriving in Leadership, um, that, was all, that was written entirely by women who were in senior leadership in the Christian college movement who were writing perspectives on leadership from their own perspectives in terms of the interior life of a thriving leader, uh, the relational life of a thriving leader, and then what leaders can do to create uh, a thriving organizational culture. Um, I just have been concerned that Christian higher ed should be modeling this kingdom orientation in terms of welcoming and embracing and supporting and affirming the best of what individual people bring with their giftedness and that we should be like Revelation talks about the place where every kindred and tribe comes together and the cultures cultural variation is appreciated and the gifts that women have to offer are appreciated. The last time I looked at the stats, there were about 60% uh, women students across the CCCU institutions, which is now 180. That includes international schools, which I've not gotten into. 40% uh, of the faculty were women and about 20% of the cabinet level leadership was women. That's changing year by year. But uh, over the last eight or 10 years, we've been working with this model that my research team developed, which looks at the outer circle there is the culture and the context of an institution. This is looking at motivators and the experiences of women moving into leadership, but now we've been applying it to people of color. Uh, so on the left, what we saw was to follow up some research out of Princeton and Duke that looked at what motivates women to get into leadership. And we really saw, you can see on the um, blue arrows there, you've got sources of validation that can push a woman toward more significant leadership, or you've got sources of resistance that hold her back for any number of reasons. And then the dotted line is the circumstances. You've got a spouse with cancer, you had twins, you've got a new president who doesn't support women in leadership. So at every stage of this leadership development model, there are circumstances at play, whether you stay where you were or whether you move forward, but you've also got different sources of validation and different sources of resistance. But the three motivators, which we saw in the research that came out of Princeton and Duke, uh, relate to, uh, for Christian women, in the context of Christian higher ed, uh, on the right hand, the calling circle is spiritual giftedness and calling and feeling a responsibility to use what God has built into us that can propel women forward. Um, the other one, which we had called mentoring, we developed more recently in the last couple of years into developmental networks of sponsorship on the bottom there. Mentors may be most important in the green circle early in the process and then having a sponsor to move farther forward and then having an executive coach to help women who who are in a male normed predominantly white culture succeed may need executive coaching. Um, so developmental relationships is another motivator that can move people forward. And then the third one we called relational responsibility. 
Um, meaning that what we saw was that a lot of women moved into more significant leadership because, for example, a president or a provost said, I really need you to do this. You're, you're good in certain areas that I don't have gifts and will be a better team if you move up. Sometimes people below saw the culture at the top and said, we need you to do this for our sake. So somebody that thinks like us um, is, is at the decision-making table. Sometimes it was colleagues alongside that affirmed, but we called it relational responsibility because the women or the person of color isn't choosing to do it for myself. It's not putting your hand up saying, I wanna be a leader. I wanna be a president. I wanna be a provost. It was almost always around a larger good and wanting to make a contribution with what these people feel like God has gifted them and called them to do. But the outer circle has two components. One is the culture or the context. So we actually did one study several years ago where uh, the participants were divided into four groups, whether there was a culture that was basically antithetical to women in leadership and unsupportive um, versus some of the Mennonite schools and the Wesleyan schools that were were more supportive of women, that influences the whole process. And then down below, self-awareness and identity also influences the whole process, where we've been trying to say in the multi-ethnic leadership development work and in the women's leadership development work, you may feel like a square peg in a round hole, but the fact is that the leadership team and all the research would say that having more diverse voices at the top um, is beneficial in all kinds of ways for organizations and institutions. So having self-awareness, in fact, um, I won't get into this, but one of the people of color that was involved with one of our research projects basically said, I flipped the whole scenario to say to the leadership team and to myself as a person of color who's an aspiring leader, uh, you need what I bring. So just, you know, just don't think <laughs> that you can ignore me or marginalize me because I'm telling you that I know from the research that leadership teams need what I would bring. So that's the model we've been building out. Um, any questions on that model? Because the other two studies relate to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll take that as a clear, all clear. So you can see the two yeah, yeah. outside circle. Well, John, you have a question? I was just wondering, can you not see your audience? No, I'm only seeing the person speaking. Okay, um, uh, take it off speaker view if you want to see your audience. I think it should be in the upper right. Um, so you're you're in speaker view, but it, but anyway, um, people were nodding their head, but um, instinctively, but but you couldn't see them. Okay, you you. You can be my uh, interpreter because I'm clicking on you but not able to pull up everybody. Uh, anyway, so um, John, did you have a question though or a thought? No, John. No, I, I was just moving from nodding my head to an uh -huh. mm -hmm. Aha. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> that pulls you into my picture. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So l I'm going to loop back to this at the end, but if I were to say, what do I want you to hear and what might you think about from what we found, these are the three takeaways that I'm still thinking about. Um, and maybe this will help you focus uh, out of some examples. So this is takeaways for discussion, reflection, or action. Um, there's tons of research out there. And obviously, there are, number one, gender is probably not binary, as is often pointed out. There are, there are women who approach life in terms of ambition or aggressiveness or um, emotional intelligence in a way that is not stereotypically what people expect of a woman, woman which creates its own issues. Similarly, similarly, there are men. So what I wrote was there's lots of variation across individuals. Alice Egley from Northwestern in Chicago, probably the go-to person on gender research, would say statistically, significantly, there is a difference overall, the top of the bell curves there in the way women lead and the way men lead. It's been decreasing, the gap has been decreasing, but still there is a difference in terms of women being more empowering, more collaborative, more oriented toward the team's collective good, less competitive, and the majority, not majority, but at the top of the um, peak for a male normed approach to leadership, it tends to be more agentic and more um, competitive and more interested in financial status and power than women. 
Uh, secondly, understanding and embracing this whole leader identity development process, process, which is what I've been focusing on, seems to offer some important insights to prepare and encourage more women and people of color for leadership roles. Um, so I think I would say that the way we have been doing leadership development in general has been largely male normed and women often feel like they're written out of the process because they don't want to buy into that. And we will see in a few minutes the same thing for people of color. To be authentic to who they are is a mismatch with the expectations of a white male normed culture and the people of color increasingly are not willing to play that game and try to be something that they're not for the sake of moving up. But they don't feel like they're accepted for who they are. Uh, and to have the platform to move up because the systems are not supporting them. And then thirdly, uh, potential future leaders from non-dominant groups benefit substantially from having a sponsor as something beyond mentorship. So those are the three things I'm gonna cover fairly quickly and then we'll see what we can do. So all of this is related to the work I've been doing with the CCCU, which is an executive leadership development umbrella of offerings which has um, every even numbered year biannual done a men's and women's leadership development institute. I know I've talked to John about this before um, and Vicki's been a part of the women's leadership development institutes. So we've had about 500 participants so far. Um, unfortunately had to cancel this past June because of COVID. So that was a disappointment because we had 70 people ready to go and we had to put it on hold. Um, but then we've also been doing women's ad leader advanced leadership institutes and multi-ethnic uh, leadership development institutes. Looking at the 500 or so participants, just back of the envelope, looking at who has moved up, uh, 87 of those participants have moved into cabinet level leaders since they were with us at the Cedar Springs Retreat Center LDIs and 17 on top of that have become presidents. I, uh, I might uh, attribute 10% of that to a four day leadership institute. <laughs> the, the schools, uh, are nominating and identifying people they believe have potential and two, two um, senior leaders need to send nomination letters. So we're already working with people. But I would say that framing their understanding around the leadership literature, getting them into a bigger network, um, helping them understand the importance of diversity and leadership, uh, connecting them with um, cabinet level leaders who are resource leaders for these institutes opens up a bigger world and helps put wind under their wings. So it's definitely had an impact. In fact, we did another research project, uh, basically asked the question, how does four days at a leadership development institute, they, about 30 people said, just in response to a single uh, email, this changed my life. So we were trying to figure out what was it about these four days that even 12 or 10 or eight years later, they would say that four days changed my life, changed my self perceptions of my leadership ability and changed my leadership journey. So, so good things are happening. I, I, might, I might add here, um, our provost, um, prior to him even um, being in, in that trajectory, when he was still, I think, Associate Dean of Bass, went to one of these leadership institutes. Mm -hmm. about what six seven years ago mm -hmm. and he's actually helped as a resource leader for uh, the multi-ethnic LDIs a couple of times since then so very very, very um, articulate on some of the things that we care about in terms of how do you carry yourself how do you how do you make it in a white normed world it was very big uh, advantage to have him involved so just I'm not going to take time on this slide, but I wanted to just show you there was a journal that came to us actually and asked us to write up about these motivators. So this article came out that was called Women's Leadership in Higher Ed, uh, Status Barriers and Motivators in this Journal of uh, Higher Ed Management, which out of this theme issue, um, our article was named the 
what most substantive contribution to the theme issue and they gave us a free registration at their conference which was kind of fun but you'll see there the three headings that were on the left side of our model so how do you motivate or what do you tap into to motivate more highly talented women to be willing to move into leadership because they don't necessarily want to move into leadership they're not grasping for leadership they're not ambitious for leadership but they're willing to serve for the good of the institution. So aligning that leadership with purpose and calling was one of the three circles. Uh, recognizing the role of relational responsibility and tapping into that as a motivator. So these women are not sticking their hand up saying, I want to be a provost. They're saying, I'm willing to be a provost for the sake of the collective common good. And because some, I would bring something that is important for my institution that I love. I love the people here and I want to serve the mission. And then third, helping people realize how to develop the potential of developmental relationships. So the two studies that I want to talk about, which I was able to put a bow on and hugely relieve my, myself of these having these bits and pieces uh, that my research teams had worked on. Um, these are the two studies that I want to talk about for a few minutes and then we'll have some interaction. Um, so they both relate to multi-ethnic LDIs, which we've been doing now since 2011 up through 2019. Um, so again, there's an application process with essay questions that they have to answer about how they perceive their own talents and abilities. They have to have two letters of endorsement and support from campus leaders. And then evidence of increased leadership capacity and affirmation on their own campus. And then they attend these four day leadership institutes. They get different books and they diff mostly HBR, Harvard Business Review articles. For the next year, they develop a one year professional development plan. And then a highlight for a lot of them is that the resource leader match each person with a handcrafted mentoring. Vicki, I'm going to give you the microphone here because I think you had a shadowing visit a long time ago as if you attended the WLDI. Is that right? Actually, I didn't because of uh well, so, uh, lots so. of different reasons. Okay, I thought you did. Okay, no. so it's pretty rare that but, people go. Hmm. Right, but I've also then had lots of people who have um, come to the campus and um, as part of their shadowing, then I met with them as I was a vice provost and stuff. So they spend a great day or two or three um, going around reading, meeting a lot of campus leaders, learning what their roles are, um, so I think it's a great time to really embed in roles on another campus. Yeah, Don, I know, has had somebody shadow him. Um, Rukshan's had several people shadow him. Yeah, uh, Andrew Barton had someone shadow him. So we've tapped APU pretty heavily to host uh, these guests who are up and comers. Uh, thanks for that, Vicki. I forgot about that, yeah. Um, so, um, the, the two research projects both relate to something I want to emphasize, which is a subtle difference between leadership development and this process of what's called leader identity development. And so this, this was an article, the cover story of Harvard Business Review back from 2013 that really changed my thinking and changed my life actually, um, where these three authors, one at Harvard, one is at Harvard, one is in France, um, wrote this article about the leadership the leader identity development process and what they describe as an often fragile process of how do people begin to see themselves as a leader and how do people begin to be seen by others as a leader especially if you're from a non-dominant group and you don't look or act or necessarily think like the dominant leader model uh, and these authors say as a leader involves much to, to this process, this fragile process involves much more than being put in a role. We all know people in roles that aren't actually leading, acquiring new skills and adopt, ad, adapting one style to the requirements of the role. It involves a fundamental identity shift. So if we haven't been doing very well, and how many of us have heard many, 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 many times, I can't find anybody uh, for my pool that meets our criteria. We just don't have people out there. Everybody that's qualified seems to be white or seems to be male. How do we begin to build in a leader identity so that people step up to the plate and put on that other persona 
uh, that allows them to move forward. So interestingly, this leader identity process, which is so fragile and either happens or falls apart, was picked up um, similarly by two authors. And when I read this really interesting article, who will lead and who will follow, um, they use almost exactly the same words as the Harvard Business Review. And they talk about a leadership identity. There's debate over whether it should be leadership identity or leader identity is co-constructed in organizations as individuals claim and grant leader and follower identities in their social interactions with reciprocal role adoption and collective endorsement. That's a mouthful. <laughs> but they're asking over time within an organization, it's all business oriented, uh, who adopts and who is identified as being a leader and who is identified as being a follower. And they say it's very iterative, it happens over time. But the key point that we looked at with this study that I'll describe in a minute was um, that this is happening at three levels simultaneously. So their research question, going back to 2010, on this claiming and granting, it's a fascinating article, it's very meaty. What are the relational and social processes involved in coming to see oneself? See, they're using the same words and being seen by others as a leader. They say there's three levels. At the individual internalization level, a person needs to begin to adopt what others may be speaking. That may be individually a relational recognition that someone says, you are really gifted at that. You have natural leadership ability. You need to speak up more because every time you talk, we, you're adding something of value. The person can either receive that and internalize it or turn it off. The second level is this relational recognition where you may be in an environment where it's a very fundamentalist environment, for example, and there's no relational recognition by the culture that people of color women have anything to offer. So that's not happening, but the individual might have enough self-confidence or enough affirmation for people of color that we've interviewed get all have gotten almost all their information from their church and social networks, not from their institution. So they have ind individual internalization of a leader identity, but it's not coming from relational recognition or collective endorsement. So I was thinking of like Megan Proster would be an example of somebody who's gotten collective endorsement um, or even Rukshan when he moved over to head the library and then moved into the business school. Um, there's a there's an institutional endorsement of certain people, or there may be an individual recognition from certain people, which is either received or not received by the individual internalization. Any, any this study of people of color. Erin. Yeah. Anita. Oh, hi, Anita. I'm still trying to see how I can see everybody, but go Did ahead. Thanks go for being here. If you go up to the top, yeah. click under view options, it has a down arrow, drop on that. And I think it can show side by side mode. Yeah, I mean, I've done this a million times. Um, Anyhow, I'm here. Okay. Um, while you're doing that, let me ask you a question though. So it's really interesting what you're talking about most recent, I mean, all of it's been interesting, but mm -hmm. when you talk about, um, I think you were saying people of color often in moving into leadership roles are not getting institutional affirmation in the same way as others report and they're getting mm -hmm. it from churches and other groups. Mm -hmm. what, what does that do about a disconnect of what each culture might value? In other words, the church might be affirming mm -hmm. some traits that don't translate well to the culture of where they're mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. And so that could continue to have this, um, not just foot in both worlds, but feeling a disconnect in what's valued. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's making sense, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and again, I'm just reporting what these people told us. And mm -hmm. it was very interesting that the, the African-American women in particular did not feel supported by their home institutions, but did feel a, a lot of support from their home churches and from their neighborhoods of being a strong black woman. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that would say that we all have 
you know, um, in, internalized, this is the whole role congruity theory, <laughs> that we assume that a leader will be a certain way or act a certain way or that women will be a certain way and act a certain way. And they felt like within their white, predominantly white institutions, who they were was not received mm -hmm. enthusiastically, but in their church setting, they could be strong, they could be viewed as leaders uh, and in their community settings as well. Sure. I think the other piece that, um that was particularly interesting is it just reinforces that idea that simply because someone has a title mm -hmm. does not mean that they're going to automatically be well received. So mm -hmm. sometimes definitely mm -hmm. hiring or titles are based upon competencies, mm -hmm. but the relational piece is really important or vice versa. Someone's hired because they're really good relationally, but they don't necessarily have the competency to carry it forward. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the complexity of hiring, mm -hmm. which John could speak to a lot, um, right. is, is certainly, I think, a parallel uh, narrative mm -hmm. here that's mm -hmm. really interesting to think yeah. about. So, thank so, so thanks, Anita. Um, one thought that comes to my mind when you say that is that book called The Confidence Code. Mm -hmm. And basically they show a man dancing along a tightrope <laughs> with a lot of confidence and the woman is hanging onto the tightrope hanging down. And the authors make the case that men tend to exude a lot of confidence whether or not they have competence. And women tend to have a lot of competence but don't exude confidence. Um, so one of the things they suggest is that people expect leaders to make decisions that women tend to be collaborative and try to involve everybody. So they are not viewed as leaders in a male norm culture. The women are intentionally choosing not to be decisive because they want to bring people along and have it be a shared mm -hmm. decision. So again, it gets back to what are the norms in your institutional culture or the broader culture about what does it mean to be a leader? There was another study by Ibera that looked at 10 characteristics in corporate cultures worldwide. Uh, nine of the 10 women were rated as high, or as high or better than men, but on the one of casting a vision, they were rated lower than men. Actually, Ibera um, was suggesting that women intentionally don't put themselves out there and like pridefully take ownership of what's being done. They want it collaboratively owned but then they're not viewed as a leader because they weren't the one that was taking the credit and putting themselves forward. Mm -hmm. That, it's so interesting. <laughs> and I think there's changes. I mean, t times are changing too, but anyway, that's what's been in the literature. And that was the experience of these people that we interviewed. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Karen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, this Hi, is Martha. Uh, Martha Bellin in yep. the yep. Uh, IRB office. How yep. are you? Thanks. I, okay, um, so thank you. Did the, did, the, did the article um, say what they were looking at for what, how they determined if someone had leadership qualities or not? Um, the Daru and Ashford article? Or which article do you mean? Uh, the one, the slide that you, the slide that you of just Of the three levels, up. of the three levels. Right. Yeah, it's totally oriented toward the business culture um, and I'm happy to send you the article, but it was basically saying this is an iterative process where people gradually or either others are bestowing them, we see leadership potential and capacity in you and that reinforces that in the person or the culture of the company and the individuals within the company are basically relegating that person to a follower status and that just keeps getting iter iteratively reinforced. So it's this claim, are you claiming and is it being granted? The, the threefold process I think is very interesting. So if you're interested, I'll send you the article. It's great, even the first couple pages. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm gonna just describe briefly two articles which I was able to button up and I feel very thankful for that. One was on uh, with 17 multi-ethnic leadership development institute participants. Um, on this whole process of developing a leader identity. If this is iterative and people can speak potential into people of color, women to get, to help bolster their sense of having leadership potential and leadership capacity. What we looked at over the year after the multi-ethnic LDI in June was in what ways and how did participating in a year long leadership development program 
including the shadowing experience and their own designed goals in their professional development plan, contribute to the leader identity development of persons who had been identified as emerging leaders of color in the CCCU, which is predominantly white institutions. And we used two primary books where every month those 17 people were asked to blog their reaction to two or three different guided questions out of the content of these two books. And then every month we set up two Zooms and they could come together to read the blog from one another and to talk about their own lived experience. Um, the book that we started on, which is this leader identity development process, is Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. And this is Ibera, who's uh, worked a lot with corporate um, contexts in Europe. Uh, she says, you begin to adopt the identity of being a leader by acting first. You'll never navel gaze your way into being a leader. So she's kind of taking the opposite perspective of Bill George and other people that are high on authentic leadership, which involves a lot of introspection and being authentic to yourself. So she suggests defining, redefining through this outside principle rather than insight. Get your head up, think about your job more broadly, develop a bro much broader, a higher network instead of being stuck in your little subculture and just redefine who you are by what you might become by putting on a different persona and beginning to be something that you were not. So she says, step up, plunge yourself into new projects, interact with different kinds of people, experiment with unfamiliar ways, take risks, right? Is their advice. So for six months, these 17 participants uh, and each of the chapters has action items and uh, questions for reflection started trying to be something that maybe they weren't yet, but they could see themselves potentially becoming or take the guts to try it. Um, so three things that we saw. One was uh, we did see this power of claiming and granting uh, play out. Even though these people did not necessarily usually feel like they had received co collective endorsement from their institutions. Uh, here were a couple of quotes from the participants that they got the collective endorsement from this group. So I, I don't like to read slides, but just to make the point that the group, somebody was saying on their Zoom, brings a whole new level of assurance, a whole new level of support. And I think it's been life changing for me. And then we joked around a lot, uh, but we I don't think that any of us were joking. I think we were really dead serious as we called out presidencies in each other. We called out other types of leadership, you know, deanships and heads of whatever. We called out these things in each other and I think we were very serious about that. So they became wind under the wings of one another, even if within their PWI, predominantly white institution, they didn't feel like they were getting that kind of endorsement of their leadership capacity from their institution. We also saw the importance of stepping out and taking risks and that, you know, I, I would say they did a lot of things that year that they would not have done the year before because they were being accountable to start acting like a leader and start thinking like a leader and do things that leaders should do, even if it's not you. So this was kind of a fun example of a person that was a director of a career center who just said, uh, was describing something she did that she would never have done the year before. It was an ad hoc trip. The president from another institution contacted me the morning of and said, we're taking the corporate jet. And it was an, it was other college presidents on that jet. So here I am, she says, uh, she's the director of the career center at her institution. And they're like, hey, we're taking this jet. So I don't have time to ask anybody. I just had to roll like I was one of them. In the moment you feel like it's just little old me. She's pretty young too. Uh, I was riding with these people, but I have to own this space and be confident in what I know and then realize I'm a child of God, just like everybody, just like everybody else. So she used that as an illustration of, um, of choosing to embrace something bigger than what she might've done previously for the sake of beginning to act like a leader and say, yeah, I can be in this corporate jet with these college presidents. It was fun to hear. Um, I would say this was a big thing, though. We heard the struggles of feeling forced to be uh, forced to follow essentially a white normed male model. So this book, Executive Presence, talks about how do you how do you carry yourself with gravitas and how do people begin to look at you as a leader? And Hewlett uh, says this. 
in terms of executive presence, it's a potent source of anguish for up and coming professionals of color. EP, executive presence, for some was a set of unwritten rules that no one had bothered to share with them. Um, for others, it was a terrain they felt like they couldn't navigate without sacrificing core aspects of their identity. Rachel, very sharp, has become actually an associate provost outside of the CCCU Asian American. Look at her words compared to what Hewlett said in the book. She said, I don't feel like I can bring my whole self into the space at work. This was when she was working at a CCCU university. I think there's so many layers to the culture there that I'm finding and unpacking. I don't even know how to start bringing myself into that space that has these hidden rules that I'm still trying to figure out. She got so discouraged with where she was, she went elsewhere. So a lot of people of these 17 expressed um, just feeling like they did not fit, could not fit, were not willing to try to fit but realized that in the culture they were working in, the perceptions of leadership were something that they were not. So that, that's interesting. So um, uh, this is the last couple of slides and then we'll open it up and see what people have to say. Um, the other study that we did, which was really interesting, um, was the role of sponsors in developing uh, emerging leaders of color. So this study had 16 people in a collaborative autoethnography. The book that we used was the one on the right, Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor. This author, Hewlett, makes the distinction between a coach at the top there who talks to you, a mentor who talks with you, and a sponsor who talks about you. And you can see in the illustration there the reciprocity of the two-way street. Oh. Um, so the sponsor, basically what the, she calls provides air cover for an emerging leader and opens doors for that leader. And in exchange, the protege delivers with exceptional loyalty and bends over backwards to help the sponsor. I use the example of technology. You know, you might have a protege who's much more savvy that backstops you when you're not sure what you're doing with technology, but the protege is younger and knows. So it's a reciprocal process, but Hewlett says sponsorship is the secret sauce, the missing link, the invisible dynamic that accounts for who is and who isn't in power, whether that person is steering a Fortune 500 company or founds a nonprofit or chairs an academic committee. Hewlett, since then, last year, 2019, wrote this book called The Sponsor Effect which is advocating people in higher up positions to take a protege underwing and all the benefits of that, how to be a better leader by investing in others. The only book we used was find, forget a mentor, find a sponsor, which I, I love that cover of the whale coming up underneath the sailboat. So what we did in this study was ask the participants, okay, you're going home from June, your job is to work with this book, which we had covered at the Leadership Institute and to find someone that you would say, I'm going to see, approach this person who I believe believes in me and ask if this person will take on this grand experiment for a year of being a sponsor, not just being a mentor. Because one of the things that we saw, and then the same process, they blogged every month and then they talked every month about what had been blogged and what their experience was living into this sponsorship experience. One thing that was surprising was how few of them had mentors. Um, and these are people that were identified as having leadership pot potential and capacity. So here was an African-American woman in her early 30s related that although she had mentored others, she had not been able to identify any past mentors. She said, I'm just not very open about these things I'm struggling with. So I think that may be a big reason why I haven't had a mentor. And most of the women in particular could not identify in their institution people that they would call a mentor. I need to finish here. But Rachel, who was older, she uh, labeled her blog, why have I been stuck for so many years? She described the dialogue with her multi-ethnic colleagues as an aha moment in which she realized her own culpability in not having mentors commenting simply, I didn't ask, I didn't know I was supposed to ask. So maybe one more, two more quick slides and then we'll be done. Um, 
it really helped these people to have clear cut language to understand that to be a mentor meant something. And maybe it was their obligation to seek out mentors. But they often felt like as people of color, they couldn't afford to look vulnerable or to look weak or to look less than. So there was a lot of discussion among themselves about feeling like um, maybe I need mentors, maybe I need a sponsor, but even being gutsy to, to seek out a sponsor, that was a very intimidating process. So we're used to the term, uh, how, the, how the terminology helped mentorship so loosely that people say, well, would you be my mentor? And sometimes there's a lack of clarity around what exactly do you want me to do for you? In a lot of relationships, it's kind of like you're expecting something and the other person is expecting something, but neither of you has clarified exactly what you want out of the relationship. So giving someone the sponsorship book and saying, I'm wondering if we could try this grand experiment where you would take on being my sponsor and I will bring this to you as your protege, could we try this experiment? And by and large, they found this to be a very, very profitable year. So I think I should stop there. Um, people, they, were, they were out of their comfort zone doing it. They felt like the fact of having done it uh, enriched their lives and opened up new doors and the year long experience of finding a sponsor open, open windows and then their sponsors gave them opportunities to do things that they may not have done without that intentional relationship. So how about if I stop sharing and we'll just, thanks, there you are. Okay. So. Who has a thought or a question? Okay, so we, we, um, we're just about out of time, but maybe we could extend five minutes um, just because um, Karen is just bringing up such uh, rich issues here. I don't want to cut it off too much on time. Leave if you need to, but we can go maybe five more minutes uh, beyond our, our designated time. So just make a noise so that you're- the yellow I, can see, goes I can see everybody now. Any thoughts, feedback out of your own experience, reflections? Well, while people are thinking, uh, let, let me just ask one question. Um, I actually had several, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with this one here, just because I've been thinking about it right, right at the end there. Um, I'll just say it. I mean, I'm a white male, obviously. Um, well, and um, it, it, it's, I have some of the same discomfort when I look at leadership that you're suggesting that um, females and and minorities, um, you know, people of color have. So I, I I just wonder how much of it is a white male thing, or you know, what I mean, I, I I feel the same kind of ill at ease. Um, I don't fit, you know, not all the time, things mm -hmm. like that. And I know my situation is different, but I, you know, those thoughts kept coming to me while you were sharing that and I and I know you've thought about that and and you're an expert in that but mm -hmm. could you comment on that mm -hmm. do you say that partly because you're an introvert uh, probably well I mean I don't know why I say that but I am an intro introvert yeah well I think that there are norms and others could speak to this as well um, of what should a leader be like a leader should be decisive what we call agentic make things happen be self-confident um, take charge of the room and as I said, with the two bell curves, there's yeah. a lot of different personalities involved and there would be women that are actually more male normed in the way they go about life and men that are more female normed from these stereotypes. Okay, well, well but then going back to that even, when you showed that curve, you made a comment that the, I'm kind of pivoting to a new question now, um, that the difference between the norms between the two groups is decreasing. Why is it decreasing? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> so we're looking at generational differences. I mean, I think next year will be different than this year because of all the racial um, trauma in our country and the fact that people of color are not willing to put up with what has been. Women are not willing to put up with what has been. Um, I mean, we're, we're moving into an entirely different era, but I would say these things are very, very deep. And I've been concerned about Christian higher ed, but when I go to something like the International Leadership Association, 
the same issues are there in, you know, corporate culture in Europe and secular higher education. I mean, I think in some ways it's worse for us, but the, the issues are real, the stereotypes and the perceptions. Yeah, so I guess I, I would say, and I'm happy to stay on if anybody wants to talk more, but um, I really, I think the driver for me is the Ephesians 2 verse, that God has uniquely gifted every human being. And, and Ephesians 2.10 says, uh, you were created and designed to do good works that you're supposed to walk into. And I wish that Christian higher ed believed that every human being <laughs> Um, had was designed to offer something in our job as the body of Christ is to free that up and um, and affirm that whether you're black, white, Asian American, young, <laughs> that our job is to free up the capacity in every human being. And I I I I don't fear, but I am sad that so often uh, people that have a lot to offer are not given a platform or support to become that and be that and bring that. And I think our schools should be the places that do that. So, well, thank you for joining us. See now, I wish you could come over and look at my coffee table book and we'll have fruit salad for lunch and just chat. Anybody else have a question or thought? I, One last I, have, question. A, I don't have a, I don't have a, I had a quick, very quick question. question. Um, oh, go ahead, Marta. <laughs> just, um, um, are there uh, similar opportunities um, such as the Leadership Institute that you mentioned for um, middle administrators? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and thanks also for your interest over the years, Marta. And I see Jody there, so thank you. Um, I think the best thing that we've been doing is that Advancing Women in Leadership Conference, which is designed for people to drive in. And in a very full day, if you've been able to go to some of those, I'm amazed at how many good seeds get planted in one day and conversations and sessions and plenaries. So I hope that we can return. We canceled the one that Cal Baptist was going to host in the spring. Mm -hmm. We're talking now with Westmont about maybe doing something decentralized this March for Women's History Month where they would have a smaller group that could gather over at Westmont, but then do satellite downloads or some kind of technology, just so we don't lose another year. But that would be the best thing locally that I know of. That's designed to help up and comers and middle management people that also, I mean, this is, this is the, the blood, the heartbeat of the whole institution is the people in the middle, right? Yeah. <laughs> Often staff. Yeah. Yeah. Was you, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I am thinking like if there's a mentorship program for the middle management, that will be really helpful for us. Like sometimes I'm really confused like where I can move forward to or move horizontally or move upward or what, what we can do. I mean, like kind of right now uh, as a minority, as a woman, then I think I'm, I'm working daily just like just like a mouse in a in 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 a, in a circle, keep keep working, <laughs> keep just performing, and and but where where should I go? You know that is really confused sometimes. Like, uh, am I doing this for my whole life? Don, I will be in my job for my whole life. I know that, uh, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, so where my next step? Mm -hmm. What can we do? You know, if we can have some kind of mentor that can help me out and clear up some of my questions that will be really helpful mm -hmm. so a couple thoughts on that i believe that uh andrew barton was tasked a year or two ago to think about leadership development um Vic, you might know something about that uh and louise wong has approached me a couple of times about her desire to have something available not for top tier leadership, but within APU, if you know her, you might reach out and see what she's thinking about. But I would think with Rukshan in his role, and uh, I, I'm not thinking off the top of my head whether there's anything in the strategic plan about this. Maybe you know that, Vicki, but maybe the staff council. I mean, part of it is 
that threefold individual, you know, if you say I want a mentor, the reason the uh, forget a mentor, get a sponsor book was so helpful was all of a sudden people started thinking, oh, maybe it's my job to begin to seek out some mentoring relationships. Maybe it's my opportunity, not, not my job, to, f to find a sponsor. And you could do that within offices or within departments or within the staff under the staff council or tap the higher structures of the strategic plan of the university. Do you know of anything, Vicki, like that that's going on? I, I think, again, just so many it's just been put on hold with other more crisis-oriented issues. But I think mm -hmm. what I'm hearing them say, and I, and, and I think this is really important, that a lot of times it feels like the leadership stuff is for those who want to go higher in the leadership right. hierarchy. Mm -hmm. When what you don't really want is go higher, you like your role, you like what you're doing, but you realize there's a leadership capacity that needs to be developed so you can be a sponsor for other people, a mentor, have a mentor yourself, whether that's to then expand your horizons on a national um, interactions, even interactions at the university. So it's, it's I, I think sometimes there's a framing that we always have to go higher up in leadership in order to broaden how we are as leaders in the current role that we're in and the, the role that we want to stay in because it's a role we enjoy we like it um and so where's the place card for those people who want to um expand not um, mm -hmm. rise yeah so a couple of things i would say one reason the leadership institutes have been so powerful is that it exposes people to a broader network their own world is pretty fixed and they're pretty stuck in it, but to have this other network, mm -hmm. so maybe it's a professional association or someplace that you make contacts. And secondly, I think that we need to, one reason that people of color and women often write themselves out of leadership is that we have a hierarchical view of leadership. And if you think about leadership as a, a platform for influence, then where do you want to make an influence and how can you shine there and bring others along? You can be a leader, even if positionally you're not high up or trying to be uh, positionally higher, just make a difference with your life, like Ephesians 2 says, around your own gift mix and bring other people along with you. So, um, yeah, so I mean, maybe reading the book, Forget a Mentor, Get a Sponsor, which does it does give a nod to the importance of mentoring and being proactive to develop those relationships would be something to think about, isn't it? It's a very easy book to read. You know, I think it's a good time to, um, Karen, to mention about the uh, the book Leaders or Readers group. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, and that's a, a way to also, for whatever book's being chosen, to, for uh, women on campus to come together and start broadening their horizons of other people on campus and just some really good discussion and, and sometimes even reading things that I never frankly would have picked up and read before that influence um, you know my professional and personal life. Mm -hmm. So I have coordinated that with some people that were in the leadership institutes and felt like they were never reading leadership books because that wasn't their niche, but they wanted to do more reading together. And it's it's evolved into a group of usually five to 10 people that meet once a month to read books and talk about them. So if anybody wants to be on that distribution list, you're welcome. Just email me. Okay, I, pro well, um, I promised yeah. somebody to send the claiming and granting article. Who was that? Martha. Oh, Marta. Okay. Martha, Martha. I will send it Martha. to you. Yeah, Martha. Yeah, Martha, right. Martha. Yep. Okay. Yep. We'll do. Okay. Well, okay. um, and actually the, the, okay. um, Martha Martha. the idea to, to, to look towards the staff council actually is, is timely advice because our academic administrators have now become staff members. Oh, so great. We have a, so we have a, a council to represent us. So it's, it all works together. So, um, but, but Karen, thanks so much for, um, Really, um, I want to say an excellent and uh, uh, really intriguing um, presentation, but but I think more important is uh, thanks so much for your good work um, leading up to all this, you know, the background work and just your excellent scholarship and, um, and, and yeah, so, and, um, and leadership uh, in the institutes and then within the CCCU and, and so it's, it's really was fascinating and we could probably go on for quite a while here. Mm -hmm. um, and ju just to let you know um, on, on 
uh, as a token of appreciation, um, my office has uh, made um, plans to provide you an honorarium of $100 for this, uh, just a token of appreciation. It won't be like a $100 check coming to you, but it will be added to your um, one of your pay periods. Whoa. Uh, so, so, you know, just be on the lookout for it. Thank you. To, to, to see it. Um, okay, so. Yeah, uh, thanks. But, yeah, but, but thanks so much. And, it means uh, a lot that you care about things that I care about. So thank you yeah. for your time. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm honored and it was fun. So have a yeah, great day, okay? Okay, okay Alrighty. thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Bye. Thank you.